Welcome to Rolls Talk, where we discuss a variety of issues relating to international politics and security. This series aims to facilitate discussions to better understand the developments and their implications, as well as what could or needs to be done. As always, I'm your host, Ryohinate Maguchi, Project Assistant Professor at the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology of the University of Tokyo. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Japan-US alliance and the Indo-Pacific regional security. And I'm joined by my mentor of many years, Brad Glossman, Deputy Director and Visiting Professor at the Center for Rulemaking Strategies at Tama University, and also Senior Advisor at Pacific Forum. Brad is also the author of two books, one, Pig Japan, uh, by George, uh, from uh, Georgetown University Press in 2019, and also another co-author book uh, with Scott Snyder, Japan, South Korea, Identity Clash, uh, with uh, Columbia University Press in 2015. So Brad, thank you uh, very much for uh, coming on the program. Always a pleasure to see you, Rio. Welcome back to Tokyo. Thank you. So Brad, we've talked a lot about the Japan-US alliance over the years. Um, and at least when we look at the you know, defense relations, uh, there's been a lot of improvement over the past 10 years or so, particularly since the revision of the guidelines for Japan-US defense cooperation. Um, that said, uh, you know, I think we also tend to overlook some of the issues um, in the alliance that you know, are still there um, or some new issues that may have come along um, over the last 10 years. So first, how do you evaluate the US-Japan alliance? Um, you know, what are the positive and or sort of negative developments that you see? Well, it's, it's a huge question. Um, and so it's, my answer is probably going to be incomplete, but I would say at this point, the alliance is in good shape, and that is very much a function, I think, of the evolution of the last decade or so. Uh, the Abe administration proved to be, I think, uh, a very uh, faithful and, and, and positive steward of the relationship, uh, producing a lot of the changes that both coincided with his particular agenda, uh, changes that we can go into, but you know, had a great deal to do with restructuring the national security bureaucracy, of changing certain laws, of essentially being the forward-leaning partner that the Americans have long wanted from a Japanese prime minister, much of that just being a function of his longevity mm -hmm. in the Kante, which was, again, a really key enabler of his success. And then, um, you know, having, he, he proved to be, quite frankly, and I think very surprisingly, you know, the Trump whisper through what could have been an incredibly difficult four years uh, proved to be a very, very capable of navigating the, the treacherous currents and eddies of the Donald Trump presidency, uh, better perhaps than anybody else, uh, mm -hmm. any other world leader. And I mean, we could talk about that because I think that was a remarkable accomplishment given precisely, given Trump's background and given uh, Abe's particular standing and status in Japan's place. But the bottom line becomes, I think that the changes in Japan, the um, capabilities put forward most broadly conceived by the prime minister. And then, of course, the readiness of the United States to change its views of regional security and to, to move forward, you know, made Japan in many ways the preferred partner and the ideal partner. And there's a lot more to be done, as you said, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. But I think at this moment, the alliance is in a particularly good place. And the concerns that I think we have to face are going to reflect or very much be a product of, of Japanese politics, to be very honest with you, and whether or not we're returning to a, a cycle of uh, a revolving door in the prime minister's office, which would undermine a lot of the confidence, because if you've got a, a rapidly changing government here in Tokyo, then the United States is not going to have the partner that it really, really needs. But, um, you know, you see, particularly with the recent announcements of the two plus two meeting that's in theory going to be scheduled for December, uh, January, I'm sorry, of next year. And reports now of a big increase in defense spending that the Japanese are cognizant of what, what's assumed both being asked of them explicitly and implicitly. And there's gonna, that the government here is going to be moving forward in ways that continue to advance the partnership and the alliance. Yeah, and on that point, I mean, what about on the US side? Because we had a change in administration over the US. Um, and there's a lot of talk in, um, and there is still a lot of talk in Japan about what the Biden administration is going to be like in the, in the uh, in Japan-US alliance here. 
Well, I mean, and that's a really good question and nobody really knows. I mean, so much of this is a function both of, of, of you know, I, I think I could tell you what Biden would like to do. And I think, but I can't tell you what will unfold in Washington, if only because the center ground of American politics has just fallen out. And what that means is, is that there is no, remarkably, almost no ability or readiness or willingness to work across the aisle to get anything done. So, and, and, and while that might seem to be a domestic political problem, the fact that we do not have an ambassador here in Tokyo yeah. speaks to just the, the, the extent to which, you know, ostensibly national security minded members of the Republican party are still prepared to hold up everything in the name of obstruction and, and just sheer contrariness. So there's the domestic politics. And then the third piece of that, of course, is, is the external environment. And, and by this, I mean, that invites a larger conversation about what China is doing and where it is that the United States is prepared to go and, and you know, uh, developments. And, and, and I'm sorry that this is a kind of incoherent answer as I listen to myself speak, but so for example, you know, the, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan to go back a few months should have been a moment that really reinsured allies for saying the United States is serious about, or the Biden administration is serious about eliminating distractions and drags on its commitment to this region and eliminating what was really just a black hole of time, commitment, et cetera, attention, most importantly, attention. And yet it was so f f horrendously botched that it raised questions about capability of competence. And what it's going to open the door to is if there is a you know, the opportunity, of course, for the Republicans to score points on that rather than focus on harder security questions are going to litigate exactly what happened to score political points in, in the lead up to the 2024 election. Um, if in the, in, in the event, for example, as we anticipate a, a shift in control of at least one House of Congress in, in the 2022 midterms, um, you know, you've got, in theory, the call for uh, greater attention to Taiwan, which really is what a lot of folks in Japan would like to see, but it raises some concerns about, well, is Biden truly committed? Is he, you know, how, um, uh, how, how, you know, how much on top of his game is he? You know, some of these these gaffes or, or, or misstatements in recent weeks and months have, have raised concern that he's, you know, maybe not exactly as 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 sharp as he once was. And I think a lot of this is actually going to play out very specifically in the discussion, the debates, and the ultimate. Uh, uh, production of the nuclear posture review and whether or not, for example, there is a change in U.S. policy in ways that unnerve uh, allies, in particular Japan. Now, before you ask me questions, and I know you're itching to, because there's a lot, again, to unpack in these answers, you know, there are ways in which the evolution of the alliance and the evolution of the security partnerships, pieces are being put in place in ways that could actually, I would think, reinforce questions about re issues or concerns about reinsurance or not, I'm sorry, not reinforce concerns, but actually go a long way to answer questions about reassurance if done properly. But there's no guarantee that they will. And so I think, you know, the, the articulation of the nuclear strategy that comes out next year, however, whatever form it's published and it's still not clear, will go a long way to either affirm or, um, you know, magnify uh, some concerns in Japan or, or, or put them to rest. But my feeling is, is that the, very much of the, 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 as you put it, the views of Japan that Van has about the alliance and about the Biden administration are very much just a function of what's of, of you know kooky. It's what's in the air, and I'm not I'm not convinced that there's a whole lot that anybody's going to be able to do. That if the Japanese get nervous, that uh, will the Americans will be able to do to allay those concerns? Yeah, because I thought you know when we're listening and some of the conversations here in Tokyo um, or Japan overall. You know, some have said that the U.S. has, like, you know, uh, the so strength or the influence of the United States in Asia has declined over the years. Um, you know, with some saying, look, um, one of the reasons for the Japan uh, Korea relations gone bad is not just because of Korea, but also because the U.S. hasn't, really, you know, done much or is not able to do as much as they did before, um, and and things like that. I mean, what do you think about you know voices like that? Well, I mean, the world has changed. And I think that we have to, and we've been very slow mm. to acknowledge that an international order that was built upon a distribution of power and wealth in the 1940s and 50s has got to adjust to what is a very different yeah. world 70 years later. And we've just been really, really loath to do it. You know, the, the, the remarkable thing I like to say is, or the thing that I like to say is, is remarkable, is that 
the closing of the gap between the West and the rest in the United States and other countries should be a demonstration of the efficacy and the, you know, the wisdom of the vision, right? It's remarkable that the U.S. did not lock in a global order or try to lock in a global order that permanently cemented its status as a global hegemon. And while we would like to retain that leadership position, ultimately we empowered everybody, including in some cases countries that have turned out to be adversarial in their interests. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we should look at that evolution as calling for reform, but at the same time, emboldening, requiring us and obligating us in the, in the United States and the West and our partners to, you know, have to now work at demonstrating the superiority of the system that we support. We can't take it for granted, and we've got to do a much, much better job of selling that narrative to the rest of the world. And that, you know, that's that takes us into this discussion about the Summit for Democracies that was held last week, and just more broadly, the fact that the West has done just a poor, poor job of selling itself, selling its ideas, selling its values, selling its position to the rest of the world. Yeah, and like speaking of values, um, you know, when I was since my time at the Pacific Forum. We often talk about expectations that allies have towards one another uh, because mm -hmm. that has a big impact on credibility and so forth. So in the last several years, um, to what extent has, been, so has there been changes in the US and Japanese perceptions um, or expectations toward one another in the last? Do you see any changes there? Absolutely, but I mean, understandably, again, number one, mm -hmm. we've lived in a world in which our threats are different. I mean, it's not, there are military threats, but there are different range, both of security threats, broadly defined, and just the nature of, of the, the competition. And this invites a longer conversation if you want to have it about the nature of the, converse, the competition between both the West and China and the West and those dissatisfied powers that are revisionist more generally. Uh, and there are two different sets of problems. That's number one. Number two, the United States is increasingly constrained uh, you know, in terms of what it, it can no longer sustain the, the extraordinary defense budget increases or the single-minded focus on, on, on all problems of the world, that we're just, we have greater restraints, a function both of our own domestic difficulties, whether it's budgetary, political, social, et cetera, or the fact that our potential adversaries have become more capable and the, the threat environment is so transformed. I mean, you just, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not 360 degrees anymore. It's, it's I like to say it's 720 which means you've got to be worried about, you know, attacks from every direction or, or dangers from every direction and in dangers in all sorts of new sorts of issues areas. So it's a completely different way, I think, of looking at the threat environment. And the third piece of this is the degree to which, um, you know, allies and partners are better capable of contributing to defense. So the expectations, to go to your question, the expectations have changed because we, are, we expect others to do more as a way of demonstrating, because they can, and as a way of demonstrating their commitment. You know, the gap between what the US and Japan can do or the US and almost any other partner, in some cases remains great, in other cases is much, much reduced. And, you know, expectations and, and deterrence and commitments are a function of mutual obligations and mutual reactions and responses. And what we need to see, I think, is, you know, the United States asking its allies to do, no, to do more, not as a way of offloading burdens per se. I mean, it's about sharing burdens, but in taking those burdens on, those partners become, in our eyes, more worthy partners. Yeah, so when we look at, for example, the Armitage Night Report, a lot of Japanese will see that, um, well, <laughs> they're the series, right? I mean, that's what's often used as a way to gauge U.S. expectations towards Japan or sort of requests or very much request towards japan right yes if you were to write a report card on japan's progress how would you like would you give it an a or a b or c like how would you how, how would you evaluate it like uh, japan's made great progress i mean that's where we started mm. this conversation i think yeah. we recognize that but i mean there's still as always not only is there unfinished work to be done but there's new work to be done and that's always the problem. And I mean, you know, you talk to certain people will focus on different pieces of the relationship and they will give higher or lower grades. So, for example, if you're focused on the military piece, if you're one of the RAND guys, if you're Jeff Hornung, of course, you're going to applaud Japan because you believe in the alliance, but you're going to be a little bothered that the Japanese have canceled Aegis Ashore. You're going to be a little concerned that the budget remains as low as it is, that there hasn't been the increases that 
have been pushed for so long. Um, one of the numbers that I'm still dying to see, which I, I you know, you always hear, for example, and I was reading this morning, that the Japanese have, have looked, pushed for something like a 30%, a huge increase in defense spending. What I want to see is how much of that money gets spent. Very in, 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 in traditionally, those funds, a large fund, percentage of those funds do not get end up going out. So the increase in budget really doesn't mean that much because it's not actually translating into defense capabilities increases or whatever, regardless of the breakdown from procurement to personnel, et cetera, and, and all that other stuff. So if you're focusing on the military piece, and, and you know, I have former uh, military guys, friends of mine who are you know decrying, as I'm sure you would, uh, the, the inability to get beyond the jointness of, of operation to get beyond the separateness and the silos and to, to move to real jointness and all that. So, you know, on that piece of the puzzle, you can say, well, there's been this increase. We've seen the improvements. You know, we will take some solace from the debate about strike and the seriousness, although that's another issue altogether. And we can say that they've made great progress or, you know, you, the glass could easily be half empty because you're, you're worried about these other things. If that's the, if that's the measure of your, um, uh, uh, expectations. If on the other hand, you want to talk about diplomacy, what I, I look at, and I would say that the, one of the greatest achievements of the last decade is Abe, Prime Minister Abe's ability to keep the TPP alive and its resurrection when the U.S. pulled out and to maintain that particular trade agreement, which I think is equally as, as you know, one PACOM commander said, the equivalent of another aircraft carrier. And I'm, I'm inclined to look at the Japanese presence diplomatically and economically as being of huge importance. And so that, the readiness of the Japanese to step up and be aggressive and lean forward, that's a great thing. And it's something that the Americans probably will never appreciate. I mean, there are folks, Kurt Campbell, the, the Indo-Pacific czar, and, and um, Eli Ratner, even though he's, he's in, the, in the Pentagon or, or um, uh, uh, Crittenbrink at, at State, will truly appreciate the value of those things. Um, but, you know, we tend sometimes to not really fold that into the alliance category when we think about it. I think those are extraordinary uh, uh, um, uh, um, accomplishments. Similarly, the diplomatic uh, press on the Quad, uh, you know, the, the, Japan's forging of relationships with Australia, with India, with other partners, its promotion of ODA for some developing countries in the South China Sea, its work with the Philippines, Vietnam, its private organizations working through with Singapore, Malaysia, et cetera, all that's of, of, of huge importance. Um, so uh, by those measures, I think, you know, the Japanese have done a lot and I think they deserve more credit for it. And our reluctance to kind of fold that in to, 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 to credit it appropriately, I think just reflects very much a, a, an industrial Cold War, post Cold War, pre this moment understanding of the way we conceptualize security. Yeah. Now, so there's a lot of things that, a lot of achievements that have been sort of underappreciated, um, as you just said, like diplomatically and economically and so forth. Well, what about vulnerabilities? So, do you see any sort of key, like critical vulnerabilities that need to be sort of filled or addressed before sure. we move on? Yeah, well, no, before we move on, no. While we move on, yes. I don't think we have time to do this sequentially. Mm -hmm. This is way too, you know, th these issues are too urgent for us to say we'll put, uh, it, if it's worthy of our conversation here, it's not something I think we should be putting off. The first one I think clearly is cybersecurity. There just is not sufficient uh, um, attention here, or growing attention, but not sufficient response to the threats posed by cybersecurity. And and it's both a public and a private sector uh, uh, problem, you know, and, and um I don't know of anybody who doesn't dispute that. I mean, just the, the, the body count is way too low. The readiness of private sector just to, to share with the government vulnerabilities. Um, and, and you know everybody that studies cyber says it, it's absolutely critical that when somebody gets hacked, that they let every other everybody else know, but it's just way too sensitive in terms of, of reputational risk. So cyber is one. The relationship with South Korea is another. Um, and that's one you know well having with your history. But just the, the, the and, and I'm, I'm not talking about blame because I, at this moment, my inclination is to sadly put more of the responsibility in Seoul than it is in Tokyo. But um, the, the fact that the relationship between Japan and South Korea is so poor, I think is a, is a huge vulnerability. Um, uh, those immediate, I mean, uh, I think there probably needs to be um, some more defense spending. Uh, that's 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 a vulnerability. Uh, how it gets spent is, is another issue. Um, those are the two that, that that 
I mean, you know, the, the relationship with China strikes me as being not only ambivalent, which it is, but unanchored. And by that, I mean that it, I don't have a sense of where Japan is strategically, if it understands what its relationship with China is. I mean, that's not to say that they don't understand how large China looms in the physical traditional security space, how large it looms in Japan's um, economic uh, calculations, how large it looms, you know, in terms of the Taiwan stuff, in terms of the concerns about, um, you know, uh, technology threat, emerging tech, degree to which that it is potential uh, intellectual property issues, all of that stuff. But, it, you know, you know that you've got some folks that are really hardline and you've got some folks that are swinging and, you know, and everyone's playing the game with domestic political calculations mm -hmm. regarding Habatsu and jobs within the, within the cabinet. But I don't get a good sense that there is a genuine strategy and, and shared un understanding of how, what Japan's relationship with China is and how to really, you know, eff effectuate it and to, you know, manage that relationship in ways that best serve Japanese interest. Instead, what you really have is a bunch of decisions that are shaped by a, a number of factors that, that just lack the rigor and uh, that, that, that I think is needed. Mind you, I'm not sure the United States does either. I mean, we have a national security strategy, as do you, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a China strategy in there that's anything other than whacking on the, on, on the China uh, card or the table, hitting that hammer, hitting the nail with the hammer as often as we can. And now that you mentioned the national security strategy, um, Japan's uh, Japan's probably going to uh, revise its national security strategy um, and national defense program guidelines um, by end of next year, um, I believe. Do you think there will be any like request from the U.S. side say you know put this in there, put that in there? Um, well, I mean that's not what the U.S. That's not how the process works. Yeah, I mean it doesn't work that way. But I mean, I was wondering like, whether the U.S. would. There's things like the U.S. would want Japan to sort of absolutely. I mean, and and you would hope that the Japanese would be consulting with its allies and partners as to mm -hmm. to get their to, to hear their concerns. Um, you know, at the end of the day, just as we consult with our allies and partners, we mm -hmm. the United States, uh, when it's doing writing other key documents, and you know, it's kind of hard to differentiate between a well, let's consult. Are we consulting on the national security strategy, or is this a meeting between alliance managers? And it just, ha you know, and, and, you know, it's not like those issues don't circulate back into the conversation, whether you call it a consultation or not. Yeah, right. Um, and you know, moving on to the Taiwan issue, I mean, we talked about China, we talked about national security, national defense and so forth. Um, and there's greater attention to Taiwan now or the security of Taiwan and the threat of China towards Taiwan. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, with all this greater attention to Taiwan, um, are there any potential issues or dilemmas for the Japan-U.S. alliance? Of course, of course, sir. And, and you know, I think there's an interesting <clears throat> clarification here. More attention on Taiwan. I don't know that that is true. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and then I'll get to that in a second. The why, the, the I don't know is the key part. Because what's really different now is we're talking about Taiwan mm -hmm. publicly. Yeah. So, you know, I... My sense, having you know worked on this stuff for as long as I have, gray hair, um, is Taiwan has always been part of the conversation, but it was considered too politically sensitive to have that any of the the echoes of that conversation made public, and thus um, people would kind of when the subject came up, they would shy away. And it was generally not that we're not thinking about this. It was generally, we're not gonna speak about this, not to unclassified ears like my own. Um, so there was that. So what's changed, I think, in the last couple of years is um, a readiness to speak publicly, a readiness of Japan to speak publicly. And you know, partly that is because, frankly, Chinese foreign policy has become more aggressive and forward muscular, forward leaning and muscular. And Xi Jinping, of course, has uh, gotten rid of his, um, the, Xi Jin, the, the Deng Xiaoping 24 character guidance, keep quiet, bide, bide your time, hide your, your capabilities. Um, a growing sense of impatience on his part, the realization of the Chinese street. I think a greater sense grounded to some degree in statements and, and, and uh, and, and moves by Beijing that maybe they will be doing more 
to constrain Chinese uh, Taiwan space, which of course uh, a situation that's that's exacerbated by the presence of the Thai the Tsai government in in Taipei. But uh, the combination of a DPP president and a seemingly more ambitious and ch and 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 you know. Uh, leader in China who is really conscious of, 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 of the need for unification. That kind of elevates the urgency and the salience of the issue. And of course, there's the almost daily incursions into the airspace, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the question really, and after a long wind up, which I give you now, I'll give you a really short answer, is the issue for Taiwan is always going to be, what are American expectations of Japanese participation in the Taiwan Straits crisis? And what will the Japanese actually do? And I do not think anybody ever expects the Japanese to send a, a troop to, mm -hmm. you know, any ground self-defense forces will not be somewhere on a Taiwan island or the Taiwan, uh, main Taiwan island with guns on the ready, right? The mm -hmm. question was always going to be what protection would Japanese forces offer an American vessel if it was, uh, you know, in, in, in Japanese waters or in transit, if it was damaged, um, would the Japanese provide maritime domain, domain awareness, any uh, uh, surveillance uh, capabilities or recon information? To what degree would the, would the Japanese be ready to help as required? And to what degree would most significantly, they would Japan serve as a, as a base for throughput in the event of a crisis, right? Would, would Kadena, would, would um, uh, uh, Yokosuka, would, would they be available? Or would the threat of potential Chinese retaliation uh, scare Japan off. And if, in fact, that were to happen, if the Japanese were to say no, then I think we would have a genuine crisis in, in a real, real crisis in the alliance. Um, and then, but I don't think that's going to happen. My understanding, and I, again, I'm, I have no clearances. And so I've talked to, and I've talked to people that are in the US military. My understanding is there is a good understanding. And there, I, I don't think that there is going to be any cases of what the Jap that the Americans are going to expect something from Japan that Japan will not provide, and I think if that's the case, then we're in good shape. Yeah, um, and you know when we look at so when we sort of zoom out a little bit, look at so the Indo-Pacific region overall, how do you see the prospects and issues for the U.S.-Japan alliance in a sort of more multilateral context? Because you know we talk, we just talked about the Quad earlier, right, um, and other kinds of multilateral sort of coordination cooperation pacts. Uh, with United, with other U.S. allies and like-minded states, um, and we also hear about AUKUS now. So there's a lot of things that are just listed there. Uh, but you know, how does how do, you know are these things sort of um, how positive are they for the uh, U.S.-Japan alliance? Because obviously there's some good things, but there's there almost some again dilemmas as well, right? Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure what the downsides are. I mean, the mm. chief downside to most. I mean, there's two downsides. One real, one potential. The real downside is it's making the Chinese unhappy. Right. Um, and so, you know, and, and the, 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 the volume of their complaint is the proof of the problem. Um, and frankly, uh, we can't give Beijing a veto over what the measures that we think are, are necessary for our, our Japan, U.S., other allies' security. I, am, um, I happen to believe, for the most part, that what, what the United States and Japan, Australia, et cetera, India are all doing is largely defensive measures. But in my more honest moments, I can acknowledge that the Japanese or the Chinese won't see it that way, not only because of the disposition to do it, but because, and I wrote a piece about this recently, it's real hard not to, to, to look at what the, what, what the US is doing, et cetera. And it looks a whole lot like containment, right? Even though we say mm -hmm. it isn't. It looks, it, and, and a lot of it's in the eye of the beholder. So there is the first problem, of course, is the degree to which China is going to ratchet up tensions, blame the West and blame the U.S. and then get other countries to agree with that. And that goes back to a point I made earlier about narratives. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, the proliferation of initiatives in a whole bunch of these different areas um, is going to require is creates coordination issues. And, you know, if you look at every, you know, AUKUS, the Quad, uh, the G7, recent G7 in Cornwall, you look at the bilaterals, the U.S. ally bilaterals, U.S., Japan, U.S., Korea, U.S., Australia. There's a lot of similarity to all of those. And it makes me wonder and raises concern in my mind about how one coordinates and ensures efficiencies. 
across all these various initiatives in ways that there isn't duplication. Um, you know, ASEAN supposedly has like a thousand meetings a year and we're reaching a stage where the US and its allies are gonna have at least a meeting a day and you gotta make damn sure that there isn't too much repetition. Uh, and there isn't a way to rationalize this to avoid the waste of resources and to ensure that everybody's talking about the same thing and coming to the same conclusions and you know, working together and pulling in the same direction to, to address these problems. In some ways, for example, to keep going on, and I promise I'll stop in a sec. On, for example, AUKUS, you know, I had a number of people from Japan and actually in Southeast Asia say, you know, it really would have been nice for the Japanese to be involved because then it wouldn't just be another all white boys club. And uh, I think that what the emergence of AUKUS does is it provides some impetus to precisely those optics, to, to, to do something to, to alter those optics. And thus, it, I, I wonder if, for example, it doesn't provide with a lot of additional work as a proviso, it, a little additional steam for the Japanese bid to join Five Eyes. Um, it's certainly going to, I think, motivate the South Koreans and this is a potential problem in some ways, it's going to motivate the South Koreans to want to move more of their, their forces to submarines. And that's going to create some issues. I think, you know, invariably mm -hmm. the question becomes, they got it. Why can't we? And that's going to, that's going to cause some ripples and some tensions in various relationships. Yeah. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about AUKUS and, you know, there are concerns just like the ones that you just raised. Do you see any other kinds of potentials of uh, AUKUS for, Let's say Japan. Um, well, I mean, there's the there's the coordination on tech which the Japanese will be doing. Um, I mean, in theory, you could have some of the the higher level um, information sharing could be open to the Japanese. Uh, it, it strikes me that it's possible in some ways to be a model for some tech sharing with the Japanese on on military. Uh, the I've memory. I mean, one of the things I would look at. Is, well, for all the attention to AUKUS was there was an Osman, an Australia-US ministerial meeting right at the same time that almost got no attention. And I think that what came out of that looks like a really good template for US allied relations in the region. And mind you, the relationship with Australia is very close, very special. But there are things that could be even opened up to allies or perhaps replicated in other two plus twos. And I would presume that the North American Affairs Division is studying Osman, that, that, out, that document very closely as it looks at what's possible and maybe what the u.s will be demanding in the in the two plus two in, in um january well one of the common questions that's being asked around in the japanese media is i mean is there you know could AUKUS expand and include japan in um in in future what do you think from that sure i mean i think you know of course it could mm -hmm. uh there's just a lot of work to be done i mean remember yeah the initial, at the time of the conclusion of the deal, mm -hmm. they were launching 18 month studies on the viability of certain tech transfers and what would be going on in the various, um, you know, to, to, to make the AUKUS agreements come to life. Uh, it strikes me that there probably isn't going to be an appetite for bringing other partners in while that's on just because it's, there's enough on their plate and then figuring out what the implications you can't join an agreement when the agreement's still not not consolidated and, and, and fully formed. So I just don't think that it's a little early for that. But I think um, there are probably going to be conversations. The subject will come up and there will be no promises, but there will be uh, the opposite of teeth sucking. Uh, hopefully some positive reinforcement and some 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 beginning of some study groups to think about and, and efforts to consider what is possible. Yeah, and and going back to the question about some multilateral security pacts that include U.S. and Japan, obviously the big important one that you talked about earlier is us, uh, you know, South Korea, right? So when we look at you know Japan, uh, U.S., South Korea trilateral, you know, there's always been a lot of issues there. Um, you know, I've done some work on it in the past, but again, we seem to go nowhere. Um, you know, in the last several years. Uh, what do you think of the sort of prospects and issues there right now? Um. The great variable is the elections in Seoul, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the I think everybody understands. And I I, I have pre COVID I was traveling to Seoul four or five times a year, as you know, and mm -hmm. talking to a lot of people in virtue of some very good contacts within relatively senior levels of the South Korean military. They understand 
that Japan is an important partner. And they understand that the political relationship is acting against South Koreans, is undermining South Koreans' uh, national security interests. But they are good, they are, you know, good, good, good soldiers, which means they are subject to the whim of their political or the, the orders of their pol political masters. Um, and uh, I think they would like to see, as here, as in the United States, certainly among the warfighters, uh, greater cooperation and, and to get back to focusing on the real work of their, the three militaries and, and combating uh, threats. The, one of the problems, which I don't, which it, I wonder, to be honest at this point, what its residue has been, was the radar lock-on incident back in a few years ago. And the reason that I emphasize it was because historically, mill-mill cooperation between the two countries had been a function, had been, had been largely a shock absorber. It was over the horizon, it was out of sight, and thus it was left to its own devices. And, and, and what that incident proved more than anything else was is that the mill-mill relationship could be a source of tension too. And what that meant was is that everyone that had, that had dealt with these problems in the past suddenly found that one of their go-to tools had just been taken away and they have been deprived of it. And they didn't know what to do. I mean, I actually had people say precisely that, that we felt very much lost because something that has historically been a real net plus for us suddenly became a real problem. So that, I, I don't, and, and I honestly do not know at this point, I haven't spoken to military officials, what the level, how badly that's damaged trust and what, where that leaves the, the mill-mill relationship. Not the politics, but the mill-mill piece specifically. And that's just a, a conversation, regardless of what the political masters will permit, is one that I think needs to be had. So dialogue among military folks would be really, really useful. The third piece of this, which I think is, is important, is frankly U.S. leadership. And the, by that, what I mean is I think what the, what the last 10 years or 12 years have demonstrated was is that the United States, and, and I say this with some trepidation, but the United States really needs to come in and try to work to overcome the issues between the two countries. We can't mediate, I'm not suggesting that. We can't resolve, but we can create the opportunities in which, you know, we, we, we create the trilateral meeting where there's pressure on both of the, the leaders to sit together with the U.S. president and have a conversation and focus on, on the positives of the net, what, what needs to get done. Now, again, that person can't solve these problems. That's left, mm -hmm. that's really up to the Japanese and the South Koreans, but he can create the opportunities for them to deal with it. And in the absence, I think what we've demonstrated over the last four years was that in the absence of top level US leadership, the president calling out his two counterparts and saying, I would like to have this done, right? Really try to make it happen, that there won't be a similar effort on the part of the Japanese and South Korean leaders to press the lower level, levels of their bureaucracy to overcome the animus, to overcome the momentum and to actually engage and work on these questions more positively. They'll just let things take their course. And as we all know right now, the course is not good. So what you need is the US to help, if you will, overcome this kind of negative momentum, but it's it's it all all the U.S. can do is provide chances for the partners to work on something. We it is not our place to facilitate, to mediate, to any way work up a solution that that solves the problem. We can't, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be right, and it would not endure if it did. And when you and I, when when we talked about uh, uh, Japan career, uh, defense or security relations, um, and when we talked about this at the young leaders uh, uh, meetings and that, we talked about the importance of starting sort of broad right not just some military mill mill relations and that but some sort of non-traditional security issues economic issues and, and, and many others right that sort of surround the sort of core security uh, you know, relations is there anything that you want to sort of add into that um and say well these are the areas that we have not looked at so far but we should be looking at no i wouldn't say because i don't know what we haven't looked at i mean we've we've mm. i think and but I want to underscore the point that you're making that, and, and it's not just with South Korea and Japan. Um, I think in every, and, and for example, well, in 2003 and 2004, I had the privilege of working with the Mansfield Foundation and the Asia Society to, the Asia Foundation, sorry, to work on a, a series of, of parallel track two meetings between Japanese and Koreans in one meeting and Japanese and Chinese in another. And it was not the usual suspect. We had people from the arts. 
we had people that were influencers, right? Basically what we would call them today. But we had some politicians, we had some think tanks, tankers, we had um, uh, academics, we had, I remember two art historians, we had people that did NGOs uh, from each country. And the idea was is that to give them the opportunity to have a conversation that would not be filtered through their medium, where they would be in, in a place where they were encouraged to find common ground. And they found a lot of common ground. And it was, um, it was a very, very successful series of conversations. And I think that what we really need more than anything else right now is to commence a dialogue with people your age and memory search your mid thirties, right? Okay, well, then you're getting up there, but no, I mean, 30 year olds, late 20s, um, but people that are mid and beginning in their careers to have the opportunities to meet with their counterparts and have a conversation that is unfettered and get to get beyond the caricatures and talk about serious stuff to both see that there is a reward in that conversation and ideally maybe to produce something as a result, but not, but that's not the key. The key is to say, we're, we, we can have important discussions and we can do it in ways that allow us to move issues forward and maybe we can get something out of them. And that's not happening now. I mean, there's a few of them, but there aren't many. And one of the best things that I would hope that your institute would do and others is to facilitate those, those opportunities to, to converse. And uh, I mean, I found them to be, when I was, you know, we Americans always think we can we, we can get everybody and get together. I mean, what I really enjoyed was just creating the space and as a mediator, just sort of ensuring, therefore, not a, again, a mediator, wrong word, as the person who was, say, chairing a meeting was making sure that it was a fair and honest discussion where people could say what they truly felt and not not pay a price for that. And then once you got past the nervousness in 99% of the cases, there was an extremely productive conversation that followed. I was wondering, and you know, what you just said reminded me of something else. And that is, I was wondering whether that can be applied to uh, Japan, Taiwan relations. Well, of course it can, but the difference is, is that I'm not sure there's that much, there, there aren't obstacles to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it, there isn't a problem in the relationship right now. Mm -hmm. So I, it, it would be knocking on an open door. I'm always, my work has in, impressed upon me invariably the importance of relationships and the need to have the ability to pick up the phone when you know the, the relationship you build, the friendships, the trust that allow you both to break the stereotype and in particular circumstances as we get older and be hopefully become more important, um, that we've got somebody we can call on the other side to help us deal with the problem. Right. So I don't care if it's, if it's, if it's Korea or uh, China or um, Vietnam or Taiwan or Australia or whatever, but it's just that opportunity to build the longer term to, you know, to, to find mutual understanding that really, that, that, you can never know what that payoff is, but I always find there is one. Yeah, and the reason why I, you know, just raised uh, that question about Taiwan is because you know, Japan and Taiwan seems to like each other, at least you know, in that sort of friendship sort of way. Sure. But there's a lot of things that haven't been discussed between Japan and Taiwan, so the relationship actually isn't that deep. Right? Do but you? In, I mean, in, see, what I'm worried about is I think yeah. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I, I think it could always be deeper, but. Yeah. The problem is really that there are conversations, but certain conversations are so, I mean, and in the Taiwan context, precisely because Taiwan is such an issue and Japan's relationship with Taiwan is of such great sensitivity to China, mm -hmm. then I, I would just, all I'm suggesting is counseling a little caution and wondering what conversations have and have not been had. And I'm not talking about military stuff. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, it's just really sensitive. And there could be, you've had lots of conversations, but, and you've also been a little outside the realm for a while. Um, so there's a good chance you may not know it. Hey, I could be wrong, but I just think that you've got to be careful in this context. Yeah, 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 definitely. But yeah, it's a great idea. Always a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about, but the, and again, you know, when it comes to like security relations and so forth, or any kinds of relations, it's about how to sort of operationalize things, right? And that's sort of the, part of the big dilemma. Uh, yes and no. I mean, what's going to be really interesting is, is that until two years ago, we really didn't believe that we could have meaningful conversations except face-to-face -face. unless you were a very very senior 
government or military official when you had a weekly or daily video conference with your whatever's and from Hawaii to Washington, for example, or you know, Stratcom in Omaha or something. You know, you didn't, you, you, we believed, and I'm, I was as guilty as anybody else of believing that it, you had to be in the same room to have a meaningful discussion. It is different. And it is, there's a far, far more, particularly when it comes to people that you, you don't know well, right? That, that, that being in that format, when you have a meeting around the table and then you force to sit next to someone at a meal and talk to them, see them as persons, not as just a caricature or somebody, an interlocker with a set of interests. We believe that that was what was required. I think in the, in the, in the Zoom uh, era, in the post-COVID era, we're going to discover that there are maybe that every week we have different conferences. And, you know, frankly, the finances of that are much transformed. There are all sorts of opportunities that we just have to, you know, adjust. And my generation of people that do this stuff just are going to, we have a far greater adjustment. People like you, you're used to it, but you're also both more comfortable with the technology and the people that are underneath you are going to grow up with this stuff. And they're going to find it, I think, easier to engage on this level. And, and um, I, I just think there are, it's going to be real interesting to see how this develops. Yeah, we're definitely transitioning into new age, right? Um, yeah. Intense relations and, um, and, and, various, and various others. Well, now, on to the final question. Um, okay, very quickly, if you were to write a Glossman report on the Japan Youth Alliance, what would be some key requests that you will make or some keys of demands uh, of whom, whom? U.S. Japan, Japan U.S. Alliance. Yeah, but who, uh, who's requesting of whom? You to the United States and Japan. Oh, to both. both. Countries. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's pretty easy. Um, first thing I would, if I wrote a report, it would be the first thing U.S. should, should do is join CPTPP. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Japan should pass information security handling procedures to facilitate the exchange of information. Um. What else would I want to see? I mean, you know, I, I think that Japan should increase its defense budget. I do not think that, and this is a very controversial statement, I don't think that the Japanese are thinking about this properly. I think that they're way too wedded to big ticket prestige items, Aegis Ashore, um, uh, strike capabilities. I mean, it's a long chat, but I, I have real doubts about strike. I think that what the Japanese should be thinking about is moving away from, you know, the 2% number and Bridge Colby is a friend of mine and Bridge has written 3%. And I'm like, you're crazy, man. And he's like, I'm moving the Overton window. And I said, oh, dream on, pal. Uh, because I think that, that what needs to happen is the Japanese should spend more, but I think they really need to spend differently. And I'd like to see them move for all sorts of reasons to a very different kind of distributed sensor oriented unmanned systems kind of cheaper distributed platforms that really change a lot of thinking but i don't i don't think that really corresponds to the ways that the japanese government um is thinking about defense modernization and evolution and for someone at a center of emerging technologies that should be kind of interesting uh, to you guys um let's see on the u.s side um i mean i would just you know the first thing is like, get your act together, guys, get it, get an ambassador here, get, I mean, today Biden just announced he's, he's nominating Caroline Kennedy to be ambassador to Australia. I, at first, I'm a little stunned by Caroline Kennedy in Australia. I'm kind of, you know, why her, why there? I mean, I can guess why, but I'm not sure those are good answers and no offense to her. She's perfectly capable, I suppose, but it's, it's, almost a year into this administration, for God's sake. And we're talking nominated. We're not talking voted on yeah. hearings or anything, right? So this is just insane. And, but that's that's the Republicans. That's that's what Tom Cotton, or is it is it Tom Cotton? And I know it's Cruz, but I forget who the other one is. It's got a hold on everybody. It's just crazy. And, and so it's like, get your act together. Um, the Japanese, I would like to see um, write the national security strategy. I'd like to see the Japanese... Um, I have a couple of real personal things that I don't want to, I'm not sure I should say them here. Uh, I want, uh, yeah, uh, I, I like to see them up their game a little bit more still on economic security related issues. Um, goodness. I mean, those are the kind of, to me, the big ticket items. I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple of big things, but I mean, those are the ones that really, really, you know, cybersecurity people take cyber more seriously, take, um, 
you know, there's some there's some questions about. Uh, I'd like to see the Americans change their mindset about um, security. Quite frankly, I mean, um, this is the subject of the book I'm just finishing. That it's that we really need to break out of what is a very narrowly defined and focused national security mindset, and recognize the nature of the new competition. There's a there's an uh, an editorial I think today or in uh, commentary in today's Nikkei Asia by Mike Green of CSIS and Kurt Tong, who's a very very smart diplomat who now works for uh, Kirk Campbell's shop, and they talk. And the headline is the U.S. needs to take the China technological threat seriously, and that's just the fact that that has to be said is striking to me, but it has to be said. Uh, I think there's a whole lot of prejudices and ideas the way that the Americans think about the China threat that are just debilitating in regard to how they cripple and otherwise undermine our capacity to address these problems. So, I mean, that, that's a really bad answer. Um, you know, I wish you'd sent me these questions ahead of time. Right? Sorry. You're dead I'm to sorry. me. <laughs> no, no. I, I, for anyone that's watching, I got some questions already, but no, it's it's a it's a very good question, and um, uh, that's where I'd start. Yeah, and, and thank you. And that's a pretty good shopping list, right? Uh, you know, well, big shopping list. But you know, I think you know from our conversation, we can sort of see that a lot of the issues that we've been talking about today are really the result of the developments in the alliance. You know, that you know we see the alliance reaching new heights in some ways. You know, mm -hmm. is. Uh, that's that's how I sort of you know uh, uh, saw it, and but the, again the question is, however, is how to take the next steps forward. You know how to sort of you know operationalize or systemize uh, you know the requests or demands and and the needs and so forth that you know we've talked about so far. Really, it's an interesting phrase. I mean, you know, I was going to go with the old the, the you know, that old chestnut by uh, George Schultz. Alliances always have to be tended. It's like a garden. You've always got to tend your garden. And, you know, so it's, it's constant work. You never accomplish and you say, we're done, work here is done. It's always moving forward. But I think, you know, the other issue really is, is that expectations, changing, expe you know, changing, we, we are changing our expectations. And you do, you do something and it doesn't really mean, okay, you're done. What it means is, oh, look, you're capable of doing more. Let's see what else. Because there is an in, all practically infinite universe of demands that every country faces on these issues. And so the question is going to become, how is it that we distribute the obligations in ways that most efficiently maximize the capabilities and, and the possibilities? And we're not, um, you know, we're, our inclination is to do something and, and then kind of wash our hands of it. And that's not how this works. And the point really is also that in so many ways, the environment is evolving. So even if we solve a problem today, there is a, we, we call them emerging technologies for a reason, right? They are not emerged yet. And, and uh, so we may find tomorrow that we've got to do something differently to address these new challenges. And staying on top of that is just really, really hard. It is. It's always hard. It's always been hard. And I think that what, you know, the, 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 the difficulties to wax for a moment, because you know, I don't want to keep you going too long, is that it was twofold. The first is that the nature of the bureaucracy and the people that are tasked with handling these problems have a full inbox already, right? They are busy. Just getting through their day requires them, it, 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 they need 26 hours, period. And so that's just handling what's there. And the problem is, is that to be smart about this, you need to get in front of stuff. That means you need to think about things that are possible, probable, not necessarily concrete. And A, that requires time and creativity and expertise too, because you can't very well fashion an answer to these problems if you don't know the reality, right? And most of the people working on the reality, that, but at the same time, there is no incentive for people to think outside the box. So when you start coming up with creative solutions to problems, a lot of people are like, either don't bother me now, I've got these other 57 things that are requiring my attention today, or really, that's just kind of, that's not going to work. You don't know that because these are emerging problems and, and we don't know what the toolkit's going to be, what the, the larger context these problems in, uh, occur. So the tension between the people that are thinking creatively about problems and the people that ultimately have to implement these solutions, there's a huge disconnect by definition. And it's, it's the great challenge in our work. And just as final thought on that point, 
I would urge, you know, the, the, the bottom line is that the problems that we're looking at in most cases are problems that have been with us for a long time. I mean, whether it's the general expression or the particular and how we, the, the truth of the matter is, if it's a big problem that's been with us for a long time, the traditional solutions haven't done us a very good job. So how is it then that we think creatively about these ongoing problems, but also don't make them worse? And you can't promise me that ain't going to happen either. So, you know, it's like uh, just one quick riff, right, is Donald Trump looked at the Iran agreement and said, this isn't good enough for a whole bunch of reasons, some goods mostly bad. And he was right. It didn't deal with a lot of problems, but it was the best deal I think that could be gotten at that time. And so what he decided was that he could do better for whatever the reason, rip the deal up and suddenly, whoa, we're in worse shape than we were, which generally seems to be the consensus opinion today. And so what, and and I think similarly in in a less conspicuous or less um, uh, easily judgmental way, you know, his attempt to deal with Kim Jong-un and the meetings with him in Singapore or an attempt to break out of a box. And I think a lot of people would say, even the people that were are, that are very critical of the outcomes, were thinking, you know, it may have been worth trying. I mean, I, I too was critical insofar as you gave Kim the one thing he wanted, which was US legitimacy. But everything else to that point hadn't worked. So I'm not sure it was necessarily a bad thing to do, to try the way it was done. Again, execution is a different matter. So that's that's those are the sort of conundrums we face. And I think we're ranging a bit far and wide and man, I'm just kind of riffing on stuff here. Those things can go in the Glossman report as well. You know, good points. Well, so Brad, thank you very much for today. It was great talking with you as always. Um, and I look forward to you know, talking to you a lot more uh, about, you know, US, Japan, Korea issues in, in, the, coming, um, in the coming days and years. Well, well we're going to have lots to talk about. The subject, you know, these are evergreen issues. They're not going to be going away. Yeah, that's true. So that's it for this episode of Rolls Talk. Thank you for tuning in. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel as we'll be bringing you many more episodes that features great conversations with great guests. So stay tuned. And as always, take care. Wait, you were recording this? What? 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 (laughs) Thanks, Joe. (laughs) Thanks.